So this is a beef short loin, and the beef short loin has a couple of cool features. When we look at it from the outside, you can't really tell where or which end it's going to. When we look at it from this end, you can see this last rib, and that's going to tell us that it goes towards what primal, or towards what end? The loin. Towards the loin. The loin is made up of two things. You have the short loin and the sirloin, right? And in front of that would be the rib. Think about the ribs. So you have the, the 109 ribs, which you guys already did, right? So the, the rib's going to be in front of it. Just like in the rib, you have the bone, which comes up here. You have the chine bone right here. The feather bone comes out the back. This would be the rib. And when you got towards the short loin end of the rib, you saw those steaks went from that nice round piece to kind of a, a elongated flat piece. That muscle, the whole muscle is called the longissimus dorsi, which runs the full length. When we look on the inside, this is the tenderloin right here. This has been P, right, in the PSMO. It's been peeled. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see the tenderloin through all the fat that we'll be covering. Okay? When we look at it from this end, this is the end that goes, so it goes uh, ribeye, short loin, sirloin. So this would be the sirloin end. So when we look at it here, this is a strip steak. This is our tenderloin, or the filet. Right? Um, this is the chine bone, this is the finger or loin bone. That's what makes up the T. So we generally, when we think of a T bone, we always think of it as the T straight up. This is the chine bone, this is the finger or loin bone that separates the tenderloin from the strip. Now, another cool thing that I could do with this is, say that I wanted to save my tenderloin, which is what we're going to do. We're going to take the tenderloin off, we're going to cut that into a tenderloin roast. If I wanted to cut this here and cut the chine off and just serve a steak that's basically a bone-in strip steak, that'd be called a blade steak. So we get a blade steak, we get a porterhouse. Porterhouse is going to have a big chunk of the eye. When we look at how this tenderloin goes, see how it goes from thick to thin? A, ten a T-bone comes from this area. Where that tenderloin gets bigger, that's where you're going to get into a porterhouse. Okay? And actually, the first steak that comes off of a short loin will be called the club steak. Sometimes it will have that one rib in there. So you got club, T-bones, and then you got porterhouse out of here. Okay? What's this bone in the back called again? Chine bone. What are the bones that come back here called? Feather. The feather bones, right? Feathers are what give hamel camels and buffalo their bumps, their bones. Not like uh, the bones of pretty. So, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to remove the tenderloin. And to remove the tenderloin, we're basically going to position those feather bones down on the table. Right? And we're going to come, we're going to roll it over one more time so that we can see that chine bone. We're going to come down against the chine bone, starting at this end. And as I cut, I'm just going to roll my blade into the bone. Right? And as I cut, I also pull the meat back, and it should stay away so that you can actually see what you're doing. What, what bone am I cutting against again? Chine. Chine. chine bone. Good. Perfect. Right? So I come in against that chine bone. And now I'm going to cut down to the what bone? Let's see. Finger bone. Finger or loin bone. Good. Feathers are back here. Right, so I can just, you can see as I cut it, I can pull it back and I can see where I want to make my next cut. Cut it back, just pull it as you go. Cut down to those finger or loin bones and then just start rolling it back. Utilize the flexibility of that knife to get in nice and close to those bones. Keep following them down and off. Now, you want to be really careful. You guys have probably figured this out by day four. Your fingers have a tendency to get really cold when you're holding large pieces of meat, right? Or dead meat, so to speak. So, the problem with that is you can't really feel your fingers where they are. So, you want to always be conscious of where you're putting your fingers, right? So, you get a little bit of fat that comes off of there. We're going to come back to this. Here's where the tenderloin was. This is the chine bone, which goes down to the finger or loin bones. If I were to cut a steak out of this right now, what would it be called? A blade. A blade steak. A bone-in New York strip. What's the difference between a New York strip and a Kansas City strip steak? New York comes from... <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Same, th same thing. Where it comes from is in uh, Chicago, in the early days of meat distribution, most of the meat was centralized out of the, the stockyards of Chicago. And they'd have pallets that would be marked KC, strip steaks going to Kansas City, and some marked NY, NYC, those going to New York City. Now, what I'm doing is, remember we talked about the PSMO again. PS is peeled, side muscle on. This is the side muscle right here. What I'm doing is I'm just trimming that off. 
right now, also when we were talking about the veal, we talked about the butt tender. The butt tender would be in the next primal. It would be in the leg, and that's where that's, that's located. When we get this cleaned off, or we take this tail off, it doesn't look like a full tenderloin, if we've ever seen full tenderloins, right? It's like, it's missing the majority of it, the big chunk, right? We want to keep that. So what we do is we just take off the excess fat. Most of it will just come off with your fingers. Whenever you're working with tenderloin, you have to realize that it's a premium price for a small product. So the more you do to it, the greater you run a risk of cutting into your, to your profits. This stuff we can use for grinding. So we take that stuff off, we'll put this in our grinding pile. This is our fat, right? So we have this piece here, trim that off. Nice and pretty. Cool. Now, what happens if I put this in the oven just like this? Oh, it's going to cook unevenly because this end's going to cook. This end's going to cook faster than this end, right? So what I want to do is I want to make it even from end to end. And the way that I do that is by cutting and trussing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the end of this. I'm going to cut it about right here about three quarters of the way through, and then I'm gonna fold that back under, right? And the reason that I cut that is because if I didn't, I just bent it under, then I'd have the muscle fiber going through, and inevitably, someone's gonna be chewing that muscle fiber, it's gonna suck for them. By doing it this way, I've discontinued it, now I have straight stands stacked, stacked on top of straight strands. And I'm gonna truss it. The way that I truss it is, I put the string down in the middle, get rid of my dingleberries here. I'm gonna take that right in the middle, Come over, loop it, twist it, pull it, cinch it, just like that. And we compost the string. So, loop it, twist it, pull it, cinch it. If you want a more detailed description of that, you can actually, there's a YouTube video on how to truss. If you go to YouTube, type in Malcolm717. Exciting. Fun stuff. Now, what this truss affords us is the opportunity to say that we are working in a butcher shop, right? And our customer comes in, they're like, I'm hungry, but I'm not that hungry. Because right? if you're selling this tin it's probably going to be between 23 and 26,000 pounds. So let's say that this is three and a half pounds, that's a lot of money, right? So your customer is going to come in and say, well, I'm fixing dinner for my wife and I, I would like uh, six ounces. So you hold it up to them, be like, well, sir, this, this is six ounces. They're like, oh, that's not enough. Right, so, so you say, where would you want? So they keep moving it up and you end up selling half of it because visual, they can cut it wherever they want and they have control over it. Now, for the restaurant, say that you leave them whole because the bigger your meat is, the longer the shelf life's gonna be. So I would take this, I would wrap it in butcher paper, you have no problem going through a tenderloin in a restaurant, right? So I would leave it and I would cut it to size. So if I got a 10 ounce, then I would cut it to 10 ounces. Because the more I cut the ends off, the greater exposure I'm gonna have to running into problems. So there's my, my tenderloin ready to go from end to end. Now I'm going to take this trim, and this is what most people throw away in a restaurant. See when I cut through that fat, what's under there? Money. Right, so we're going to take this stuff off here. We're not going to go crazy because generally what I'll do with this is I'll either marinate it and do it as a satay, or I will grind it and serve it as a beef tenderloin hamburger because if you put beef tenderloin on anything, it just sells. People like beef tenderloin. So we're just going to trim off some of that excess fat from the meat out, and we save that. So that goes to our trim pile. This is our swag pile, fat. All right, and then clean as we go. Right, now, what are we left with? What's still on here? Steaks. Steaks, or the strip, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in, you're gonna take this fat off. The reason I know I'm gonna cut this off, when I feel this fat, it's hard. Right? And I know that there's more fat wherever the fat is hard. If I feel on the other side and it's soft, I know that there's not a lot of fat there. So you saw me just kind of cut, it looked like I was just kind of cutting blindly into that. But I'm feeling that fat because I know there's no meat in that fat. And that's why I'm cutting that off. I'm going to trim this back a little bit. What I'm trying to do is expose the tips of my finger or loin bones. I want to get in there so that I can cut more efficiently and remove them. 
One of the things that stands in our way right now is this rib bone. You can't really see it, but to come in, I want to come in underneath these guys, and you can see that that bone's going to be in my way. So I'm going to spin it. I'm going to come right on top of that rib bone so I can see it better now. Right, then I'm going to switch into the OJ hold, like this. <laughs> come down against that bone. What I'm doing is I'm cutting through the connective tissue that connects muscle to bone. What kind of connective tissue is that? Collagen. Collagen is in the interior, right, elastin. elastin. Right, elastin. Elastin connects muscle to bone, seen in the form of uh, ligaments and tendons, right? And you can see it's pretty tough getting that stuff off. And what I want to do now is pull it back, come in with my knife underneath that bone, and as I pull, as I cut, it should pull back. If not, just help it out. Come around it a little bit more. Yeah, see how easy that is? So easy. <laughs> So I'm gonna to go to the bottom of the bone, and give it a little help. So I've come in here, call this the button bone. So I cut in here, cut around it. Now it should. <laughs> yeah, you see that? It's awesome. <laughs> right. So cut down behind. There we go. All right. So there's a big chunk of connective tissue back here. Now you can just pull it right out. <laughs> yeah, just just like, just like that. So take the bone out. Okay. That goes to our bone pile. That's the 13th rib. We call that the Marilyn Manson rib. <laughs> okay? So now, one of the things you also want to think about is keeping your handle as clean as possible. Because once you get a little moisture on there, it starts to slide in your hand. You want to prevent that from melting. So now I can see the tip of my finger or loin bone. And I'm going to come in basically down that finger or loin bone. So we're coming down the finger or loin bone. Then I'm going to come in underneath the feather bone, same thing, and it's going to be connected on the chine. So, come in the end, coming down that finger or loin bone, and kind of the way that I'm holding my knife right now is an extension of my index finger. I'm going to pull the meat back from the end, so as I cut, I can create a good guideline and see, yeah, where I'm going. So basically what I'm doing, is I'll turn this around so you can actually see this. So I pull that back, I'm coming in against that finger or loin bone, loin bone and I'm following that down. Okay? Following it down to the chine and then out the feather. And so we keep doing that. See, I've started to free that up. Now I'm going to come in and ride against those bones. To pull that back. So as I make a cut, I can just pull that meat back. Okay, I'm going to come over the chine down to the feather, so I come over the chine, back down to the feather, spin around, and then ride out the feather. You want to get in as close to the contour of that bone, because why? Why do you, why do you think you're going to do that? You know, it's meat. Right. Bean, bones are cheap. Beans are cheap. Bones are cheap, and meat is expensive. Beans are pretty cheap, too, but I have no idea why we are talking about beans. Alright, so I'm just following that down. down to the chine. To the feather. And then right
right out the feather. Okay, and you can see that the feathers actually were pretty small here. These feathers you can actually see. feather bones and cut that off and there we have the lumbar vertebrae so it would come out of the animal like this these are the feather bones that stick up this would be where the strip point is the tendon one would be on the inside this is the giant bone those are where the spinal cord runs that goes to our bone pile. so why don't we have you go do that step those steps so far and then i'll show you how to finish that up all right, so if I was going to cut them to steaks, I'd cut them to steaks. I like to cut my steaks nice and thick, so like 8 to 10 ounces a piece, so I'd cut them like that. But what I would do that's different is I would cut them off. A lot of people will just trim this lip off and then cut them to steaks, but that lip, the meat goes from something that's thick here to something that's thin here. So if I cut that lip off, I'm greatly jeopardizing my yield. So what I do is I cut them to steaks individually and then trim the fat off them. So they're more handcrafted steaks. Now, what we're going to do with them in classical French is we're actually going to trim off all of the fat, which means it's going to be denuded. So no fat, no silver skin, and it's going to be a long roast. What they do with it then is they take it, they cut it in half this way and half this way, so they get these beautiful medallions, which is kind of the same size as a tenderloin, but this has a lot of flavor. So then they're going to roast it in the pan, they're going to sear it, slice it, it's delicious. So now that we've gone through this whole production, I hope they have it in the dining room. So it would just be embarrassing. So you're going to come in and you're going to cut back underneath the silver skin. So once you get underneath the silver skin, it's pretty easy to pull it back. See how I'm holding that silver skin and I'm not cutting into my hand? And I'm not standing close to any one because when that knife slips out, right? So we don't want to do that. What I'm feeling here is, remember I told you about the firmness of the fat? If the fat is firm, the fat is thick. If the fat is soft, then it's not that thick. So what I just did was I, I, I touched the fat. It was firm down here, soft here. So you can see I'm going in a little less aggressively in this part. So hold on to that fat, cut it back. Hold on to it, cut it back. Did I sling it on someone? <laughs> Sorry, makes it more fun. It's more engaging. It's interactive. And then the chef threw fat on me. It's freaky. <laughs> Alright, so just keep cutting fat off. That's a, that's a little inspection stamp there. Anyone know what the inspection stamp is made from? Or one of the things it's made from? It's, say it again. Food coloring? Food coloring, yes. But where the food coloring comes from is actually a byproduct of the winemaking industry. Um, anyone ever see that in those, some of those wine videos, you see them like in the oak cask and they have a weird looking chisel and they're like taking the, the tartrate crystals off the walls of the cask. That's called tartrate crystals or tartaric acid. And they reconstitute that with water and that becomes an inspection stamp. The white wine equivalent is cream of tartar, right? I know, this is very exciting. Trimming fat. It's like watching someone fish. <laughs> Riveting. Yeah, so, we're gonna come in. You can fold it up on the edge and take that connective tissue off. Thick, thick band of connective tissue. Now, I put that in my bone pile. Why would I put that in my bone pile and not throw that away? Because it's a tissue, exactly. It's connective tissue, which has a considerable amount of good stuff in it, right? Because even the, the worst connective tissue is still going to have a percentage of collagen in it. And that collagen is what's going to translate to viscous, viscousy goodness. Viscousy goodness. Say that ten times fast. Now, what I did here was I trimmed this part off. I'm going to use this for grinding. I know that when it goes up to the classroom, they're going to trim that off and throw it away. But this is going to make really good meat for grinding. 
Okay, I'm gonna come back here, just keep on working it. Work it, work it. So, this is called denuding. Has nothing to do with taking your clothes off, so you don't have to worry. Now, I would normally never do this unless I was doing it for a customer or something specific. Uh, I like to leave the fat on because the fat, especially on hand-cut steaks, helps to identify where it's from and how to cook it. Alright, and then once we get it down to this part, a little more of that fat off of that. So now what I'm looking at is that lip. And my lip kind of comes like this. The lip is the chunk of fat that rides on the end of that. And as I cut it, see how I can cut it and pull it away? I know if I'm pulling it, I'm in the right spot. And I'm not cutting into meat. Okay. So that comes off. And this is primarily fat. Now, if you cut down into that, you can see that there's meat in there. And that's why, if I was cutting them to steaks, I would hand cut that. But all this meat, we can take off, and that can be used for our trim for grinding. All right, so we use all this trim for grinding. If there's a little bit of fat on there, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. This goes to our fat pile. Groovy. A little bit of fat right here. Now, see this fat? I can't really get in there this way. What I'm going to do is, is bend it so that I can get in there a little bit more aggressively, a little bit easier. And that's about all we're going to take off. Yeah. Sometimes it helps to make that noise. Yeah. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to cut it in half. And then when they get it upstairs, they're going to cut it one step further. All right, we just cut it like this so it's easy for us to package. And that's what we're going to do in the short line. That's our strip. Oh. Cool.